Hey, this is Redim from Red Technologies. Welcome to the very first episode of my podcast. Here I'll be inviting top researchers and business leaders, friends, from the world of machine learning and AI to talk about their journey and their vision, to give you some idea of who's behind all this wonderful stuff that's happening. I sort of meet the human behind the tech. That's the theme. Today I sat down with Tomáš Mikolov, our first distinguished guest, an AI researcher currently with Facebook and author of the super popular word to vec algorithm. Tomáš is truly uncompromisingly committed to his work and to his vision of AI, as you're about to hear. This episode was recorded on the 5th of February 2017. Enjoy. Hello everyone, this is Radim. Uh, on my podcast today I have Tomáš Mikolov, ex-Googler, currently at Facebook AI, author of the word to vec algorithm and, uh, and a pleasant gentleman overall. <laughs> Hello Tomáš. Uh, hi Radim. How is it going? Oh, fine, fine. How about you? Oh, it's good. Yeah, it's uh, yeah. right off the bat it's, it's a little strange that we're speaking English uh, since we're both Czech studied in the same city so uh, that's that's globalization for you <laughs> mm. and also for the benefit of our listeners so um, it's it's early sunday morning in over here in korea tomash is in new york so uh, late evening for him uh, so hopefully we get through this without too much yawning um, tomash how did you end up in new york let's start with a bit of your background um, you have an interesting history there um, how did you end up working for Facebook? Well, that will be a pretty long story, right? So should I start from the end or from the beginning? Always best to start at the beginning. Just follow the yellow, <laughs> yellow brick road. <laughs> so that would start probably at Brno, right? Uh, at the Brno University when I started doing the research uh, uh, at, uh, at the speech uh, recognition group. That was like 2006, I think. Uh, so should I say the long version or should I say uh, kind of like the compressed version? Because this is actually a pretty long story. <laughs> so let's do it this way. So you worked through a few companies and, and they were all interesting and you did interesting things. So maybe let's do it like what was different about the the way you worked at Brno at the research lab compared to let, like when you switched to, I think you went to Google right after, right? Uh, yes. So how did that transition happen and and and? Oh, what was going on there? Well, maybe I can first to tell you about the places where I was, and then we can discuss the differences. Uh, so, as I said, I started at the uh, at the Brno in two thousand six. So then I was working on my diploma thesis on like uh, these things like language modeling and speech recognition and so on. Then I stayed there like pretty much for five years. But at the same time, I was visiting uh, some different places. I did go for a half year in two thousand ten to Johns Hopkins University. Mm-hmm. And uh, that was the speech group with uh, with Tret uh, Jelinek there and uh, Sanjeev Kudanpur. Uh, it was uh, very interesting to be there because that was the first time that I was living abroad for a longer time. And then the second thing was uh, at the University of Montreal uh, in Yosha Benjia's group in 2011. Again, I was there like around half a year. Uh, so that was kind of exciting because I was there even like at the beginning of December, right? At least... Uh, uh, till the end of the November. You joined the major league there. Uh, that's the research lab that's quite famous. Now it's quite famous. Back then it was, uh, of course, much smaller because that was 2011. Uh, so that was also a very interesting experience and a quite uh, different one than, uh, than the JHU. And then I did go to Microsoft Research in 2012 for three months uh, internship that was in uh, Redmond uh, in the Washington state. And from there, I did go to Google for like two years, uh, 2012 to 2014. And then from Google, finally to Facebook, New York, uh, that was in 2014. And, uh, and I'm in New York since then. You did all the big ones. You're only missing Amazon and, uh, <laughs> and Apple now. Well, I think there are quite a few of them that I'm still missing. So <laughs> there, is, uh, there is Apple, there is IBM. A collector. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty much it, I would guess, uh, when it comes to these big technological companies. I'm not so sure about Amazon. They definitely do some uh, some uh, development of, like, uh, say, speech recognition and so on. They do interesting stuff. I'm not so sure if they're actually doing some, some like, uh, groundbreaking research, like if they have some big goals in mind. Uh, I didn't see many papers from them. Oh, you're up to the big goals. Well, actually, kind of skipped over this, but I'm, I'm interested. How did you end up doing, like, natural 
a lot of language understanding and this type of stuff. Did, did it start in your childhood or? Uh, yeah, kind of, I would say so, because I was always interested in these things like artificial intelligence and how can we build it one, uh, one day. And uh, for that, I did uh, always think that language has to be a big part of it. Uh, because how do we want to make artificial intelligence uh, that uh, doesn't involve any language? Like it would be some strange machine maybe that would live on its own. Uh, but I wasn't really interested in this vision. So I wanted to have uh, more like sort uh, of a machine that actually will be doing some interesting things and that I, that I can actually assign tasks uh, and it can uh, ask me questions. I can ask it questions and there should be some communication. That was kind of like the high level vision that I had like a, already when I was a child and uh, and then I uh, wouldn't say that there was like some clear path how to get to that because I didn't really know how to accomplish it. I uh, was very interested in it, but uh, I was interested in many other things like uh, playing computer games. So like for many years, I was programming computer games uh, on my own and that was fun as well. Um, and I would say it's quite different than the AI research. I think back then it was quite like, I think we're about the same age. So back back then in the late 80s, early 90s, let's say, the games were really the way to go. You could do a lot on your own yeah. for these, you know, computers <laughs> back then. It was it was just fun, the graphics and, you know, mode 13H um, stuff. That, that was in the early 90s, I would say, but... Uh... But then in the late 90s, uh, the competition became uh, much stronger and the uh, 13 age with 320 times 200 pixels wasn't really enough anymore. Uh, so that's why when it was all this, uh, like getting obvious that, uh, that being competitive uh, as a single person is going to be very tough uh, yeah. in the future. Actually, I think uh, it uh, got uh, better later because uh, with internet and the mobile phones, like people can actually implement some interesting application now and succeed. Uh, uh, kind of like uh, I would say, like it's possible to succeed. But around 2000, I think it was uh, it was this difficult time when when everybody was using Microsoft uh, Windows and uh, and the DirectX, and I had a quite painful experience with it because uh, the compatibility was quite an issue. If you did uh, code the game on one computer, then making it work on another computer was uh, quite a challenge and uh, just did find it uh, pretty hard to make something that would be stable across many machines. Uh, and uh, the other thing that I didn't like so much about, uh, or not didn't like, that I did see as a, as a big obstacle for the development of the games after 2000 was that uh, really the competition was getting uh, better and better and, uh, and many teams had uh, professional uh, designers and especially professional um, uh, graphics, uh, and that was like uh, completely like impossible to compete with if you have had basically just like uh, some amateur team with one or two people. Yeah, that, this this was a that was a fun period. So, Tomas, are any of your games still around, like the DOS era? I didn't really publish it because I didn't uh, have uh, any good connection to internet. Uh, I was basically developing games on my own. I think that they could be still found on my old computer that is uh, somewhere at my parents' place, if it still works. But, yeah. yeah, just just put it on GitHub, you know? Yeah, I did actually have, have it in some competition when I was like 17 or so. Uh, so maybe I would be able to find it somewhere. Uh, and it's fun, yeah. you know, you're going to get this nostalgic feeling. Because I did it, I, I published some super old projects a few years back. Oh, really? Do you have it online? Yeah, yeah, I put a few of them on, on GitHub um, oh. and some, yeah. So maybe you can send me a link so that I can look at it. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> maybe I shouldn't promote it that much. It was really horrible. You, know? you, you always think that you're doing such a great job, but then you look back 20 years later <laughs> with such crappy code and you see bugs immediately and stuff. But yeah, but it's not about the code. It's about uh, the game itself. Like uh, It would be interesting to see what you made. Uh, just pictures would be fine for me to see. Do you have a link or something? Yeah, it was Predator and Prey. It's on GitHub. I can send you the Predator link. Predator and Prey. Okay. I think people are more curious about Google and Facebook, but yeah, it's uh, like old games like ah, uh, yeah, you know, childhood. That's uh, that's always fun to reminisce. But uh, <laughs> definitely, I think I did find it. Uh, but if there are no pictures, then I'm not gonna be able to see. Ah, yeah. There are some screenshots on there. Actually, that's that's different. Uh, no, no, I didn't find yours. It's somebody else. Predator and Prey GitHub actually gives quite a few. This was like a simulation. Like what I did is I really liked simulations. So I did a little simulation and also I, I, I worked.
worked a bit on AI. I did the five in a row, you know, that game everybody plays under the desk at school. So I wrote a little engine. Actually, my handle on GitHub is Pishkorki, which, as, as you know, means five in a row in, in Czech. I see, I see. So that kind of stuck with me. So, yeah. Ah, cool. I did find your project. So that's some OpenGL uh, stuff, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, cool. So I see. Uh, that reminds me a bit of uh, the game that I uh, made as well. That was uh, 3D Flight Simulator. Uh, so I'm really sad that I can't send you pictures because I think it was looking a bit better. <laughs> no, I shouldn't say that, right? Oh, no, this, this was nothing. This was more like the, the fun with the simulation. But really, let's move on. I don't want to talk about my ancient projects. It's, this is more about you. So you, you always knew you wanted to do this this communication and AI. For me, it was a bit different. Uh, I really like languages and, and like beginnings of you know history and so on. And I kind of moved gradually uh, into computers and so on. But uh, we ended up in a pretty similar space, I would say. Hmm. So that was at the university, you did the internship, and uh, then you got the offer from Google. How did that come about? Uh, that was in 2012. Just before that, uh, what you said actually reminded me another story. So when it comes to the languages, I didn't really get to the languages that late. Uh, I would say uh, maybe I began uh, being interested in language, uh, languages much uh, sooner because uh I had a part of the family in Poland and we used to visit them. And it was actually very fun to think about like the similarities between languages. And I did uh, discuss it with my grandfather quite a bit when I was a kid. And it actually makes you think about like, uh, uh, how is it possible that you can understand a new world like right away based on the context and these things. Uh, and just because you already, for example, know a bunch of the words in that given language. So I felt that there's kind of like uh, this, uh, representation of the words that it's not just the word itself, but it's basically the context in which the word appears. And uh, I feel that that's basically the way how we can translate uh, the words uh, in like similar languages, how we can actually guess the meaning uh, very accurately. So that's the feeling that I already had like uh, uh, when I was, uh, I don't know, like five, six, seven years old. And uh, later actually at Google, I did write a paper about this idea it kind of works. So just one story to say before we jump to this uh, Google thing. Uh, so uh, much later, so you are asking how I ended up at Google. It was like 2012, I believe. It was when I was already about to graduate and uh, uh, a time when I was asked uh, to do internship at uh, Microsoft Research by Jeff Zweig. And at the same time, uh, several people at Google also like uh, were asking me if I would like to come to do internship with them. But I was already at the fifth year. Uh, and about to graduate, and I couldn't really go for both, so I uh, had to choose one. So Microsoft Research was actually like uh, very fast. They did just give me the offer right away, and I said that, uh, sure, I'm interested. Let me ask you a question here. So I think a lot of people are curious, or will be curious how how this happened. You make it sound so easy. You know, I got this offer from Microsoft, I got this offer from Google, so I, I got to choose, but... <laughs> How did it actually happen for you? Did you get good? Was it through networking or was it some, some article that you published? Did you know the people? If somebody wanted to walk in your footstep, what would you say was the, the critical? Well, in my opinion, it was uh, definitely the work that I was doing. Uh, that was the recurrent network language uh, modeling stuff. Uh, I published that already in 2010 at uh, Interspeech in uh, Japan. And I did make uh, pretty big claims back then that it's, uh, it's the best language model and so on. And it's very simple. And uh, and uh, actually, many people didn't really believe it back then because there was a lot of uh, like similar stories back in the history where people did make big claims and it turned out that they just did screw up, say, probability normalization or something, that, they, that their numbers are actually not really that, uh, that good as they were claiming. Mm -hmm. But it wasn't my case. So actually, the numbers that I was presenting, even if they did... Uh, look uh, kind of unbelievable to some people from, for example, when I was presenting uh, the numbers to Fred Jelinek at the uh, GHU, uh, like, I don't know if you know him, he's actually like a very famous, uh, he was very famous uh, uh, researcher originally from Czech, um, who did start. The guy who made the famous um, quote, like every time I fire a linguist, uh, the accuracy <laughs> goes up, right? I actually like the quote very much, but uh, he was later saying that he didn't really say it like that. Uh, but uh, it's kind of, Funny quote, uh, 
for various reasons. We can discuss it too. Uh, but uh, back to Fred, like uh, he started uh, this uh, speech recognition team at IBM and he was pushing the statistical techniques uh, already in the 70s where uh, many people did believe much more in the rule-based approaches. So uh, he was like very famous and he was very excited about language modeling. Uh, and I was presenting uh, the results with uh, the Recon networks to him. He was very skeptical and uh, he was basically uh, certain that I have to have uh, bugs somewhere because uh, in comparison to other techniques, the gap was really huge. Like, uh, for example, in speech recognition, when you did change from uh, from like trigrams to some fancy language model, you did get like 0.3% improvement to the order rate. But uh, with, the, with the recurrent nets, it wasn't like 0.3, it was more like 3% uh, improvement. So it was like 10 times bigger and it was really huge. So he did uh, Kenya naturally, I would say, uh, not believe that it's uh, so easy to make it happen because if you actually look at the model, uh, it looks like very simply as some input word and then you have probability distribution in between that you had the hidden error that has a recurrent connection. That's pretty much it. And uh, many people are skeptical that you can actually make it uh, like uh, work as well as I did uh, because uh, there was a lot of skepticism about the recurrent networks in general that uh, people did believe that it's not possible to train them uh, and that turned out to be wrong, of course, because now everybody does train them. So I think this was actually uh, what started uh, like uh, this uh, this career that I had. Uh, that I had uh, very interesting results, and I published the code early in 2010, so many people could actually reproduce the numbers. And it took quite a while because, as I said, like there was a lot of skepticism in the beginning, but already in uh, 2011, 2012, many groups. Uh, they're very interested in uh, in this kind of work, and that's actually why uh, people were asking me for the internships. Mm. Okay, so I think that the short answer is you did amazing work, and uh, I mean, <laughs> well, yeah, one, two, three profits. <laughs> that's how it works. So uh, <laughs> yeah, just get state of the art results on some important data set, and then that's basically it. Uh, okay, sure, cool. So you got the offers, and yeah, you decided to go for uh, for Google, huh? Actually, I decided to go to uh, Microsoft because uh, they just gave me the offer very quickly and I didn't really see much difference between the places. Uh, plus, uh, Google did take ages, basically. Uh, they wanted to do some interviews with me over the phone, which uh, is kind of like uh, kind of difficult to do when uh, you have like uh, you are uh, communicating with people in California from Czech. It's like nine hours difference in time. It took them like uh, several weeks to set up just the phone interviews. And basically the whole process did take so long that I already had long uh, time ago accepted the Microsoft research offer before Google did, uh, did uh, make any decision. Later, they actually wanted still me to come. And because I couldn't do second internship with them because uh, I was about to graduate already, then they were thinking about uh, giving me postdoc offer. So that, and they did invite me to Mountain View for interviews. Uh, that was in think beginning of April 2012 still. So I did go there. It was kind of painful experience because uh, after I arrived, I actually got flu in uh, like you know, just the next day after I arrived. So when I was supposed to go for the interviews. So I had to stay basically at the bed for like three or four days and I just couldn't do anything. I think you told me this story when we met in, in Italy and that's, that must be a yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah. But in the end, you, you managed to to do the interview one, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, actually I did uh, convince people to basically change the date of the interview to the next week and I stayed in Mountain View in some hotel and uh, then I did go next week uh, when I was still not feeling well, but uh, well enough to at least be able to walk, which was impossible. You don't need your 100% to get to Google. Okay. Mm. <laughs> okay. So that's, that's quite interesting. So how long did you stay with Microsoft? Uh, just three months, like that was a uh, 12 weeks long internship. It was actually very, very interesting for me because it was the first time that I was in, uh, in some like uh, big company. And uh, I would say that Microsoft uh, as an old company has like uh, everything, I would say smooth uh, in, in a way that uh, the internship was like very interesting experience uh, because everything was working very well. And uh, they did take us, uh, take uh, care of us like a, uh, arrange pretty much everything, accommodation and uh, the airplane tickets. Everything was like very smooth and easy. Uh, just like my mentor there was also like great. And uh, I did like very much working with him. We ended up publishing uh, how many, like two or three papers uh, after that short internship. So 
things were moving quickly and uh, and uh, there were results. So I did actually like it very much. Great. So, but you moved to Google nevertheless? Uh, yeah, because I already did accept the, the offer from them before I started that Microsoft uh, internship. So, do you know, I wanted to see both places. <laughs> <laughs> I understand that. <laughs> they offer the right package. Uh, offer at Google? Oh, yeah, that was quite basic, I would say, when I was uh, joining them back then. Cool. So then Google, that's actually when word to vec happened, right? It's that, that period. Uh, yeah, actually, I did uh, have it um, kind of done even before I did uh, come to Google. But I was improving it uh, at Google because... Uh, I just did feel there's a lot of reasons to publish it uh, that uh, many people back then didn't really understand much about how to train these word vectors and uh, what it is. And uh, I did see many like confusing publications where people were trying uh, all kinds of crazy things uh, that I just felt were a big pain to do because uh, competition really didn't really make much sense to have like many hidden layers in, in neural networks to end up uh, in the end just with word vectors. So... Uh, I just did try to fix the situation and I knew that if I will just publish some paper where I will make these claims that nobody will really care. So I was working on this uh, on this uh, code to open source at the same time. You actually have a pretty pretty cool story with work to vec as well with, with your supervisor, I think it was. Can, can you share that story? Uh, it was a story like nobody believed that it actually works. And, and like uh, that you can do this sort of algebra with the, with the vectors directly. Oh, algebra. Yeah, yeah. It was actually a story already at uh, Microsoft Research because I was showing this uh, already there during the summer of 2012. Uh, so uh, that it was uh, more like the other way around. I did already know like uh, that these war vectors have very interesting properties since I was working with them uh, in 2006, 2007 for like uh, with, uh, the Czech language. Uh, where I think actually it makes a lot of sense to think about these uh, components of words because you have like this uh, ending of words and truth of the word and uh, the prefix. Uh, yeah, much, much richer. Than yeah, yeah. yeah, you actually can completely see it in the language. And also Czech is uh, half made uh, artificially by linguists. Uh, like the language is uh, not completely natural in everything, as you know. Uh, so... Uh, it's, uh, I would say, very easy if you are a Czech speaker to understand that there are some strong regularities and uh, that there may be some way how to capture them based on uh, some sort of statistics. And as I said, I did already see that, for example, you can group uh, words by their endings uh, even without actually looking at the structure of the words just by looking at the statistics of, uh, of the occurrence in uh, in, uh, in data sets. And... Uh, then uh, when I was at uh, Microsoft Research in 2012, uh, fun story that we were asking for was like uh, this uh, this equation with that uh, king minus man plus woman is equal to queen. So I knew already that uh, that these word vectors have these interesting stories, and uh, I wanted uh, to convince uh, Jeff Zweig, uh, who was my mentor there, uh, that uh, that uh, this uh, this is something interesting. Uh, when I did uh, just slightly mention the idea to him, he didn't seem convinced at all that it can work and that something like uh, this can be doable. So I did uh, create this fun example. And I asked him if he thinks that uh, it would be possible to basically take just these word vectors and do plus minus and end up with the result. And uh, of course, he did say like, oh, of course not, like this is completely stupid. And he was looking at me like uh, as if I was going crazy. Uh, so I did take him to the computer and I did show him like, oh, look, just... Uh, you just uh, look for the nearest neighbor and uh, this is the result. And uh, it was the queen. Uh, so he was like very surprised back then and uh, and then immediately got excited and started thinking about like if we can evaluate this in some more like rigorous way. So he did put together a data set where you can measure like uh, this accuracy of, uh, of different uh, versions of these word vectors on like some some sort of like uh, syntactic data sets like when you are trying to guess the past tense of some verb and so on. So I, I think that was like the beginning of like this uh, this uh, hype uh, uh, around uh, these linguistic regularities. Mm -hmm. Yeah, hype. That, that's a good word. Yeah, it's it's become super popular. It, it feels like it's you know like when LSI latent semantic indexing, which is like an ancient technique from like thirty years ago, or something when the patent expired, the the CEO people kind of took over. It became their snake oil. You know. We do LSI, and I feel like Word2Vec is reaching that level now. Like people are talking about Word2Vec in 
in all sorts sure. of contexts and applications. How do you, did you, well, first of all, did you expect it would become such a hit, you know, even for lay people by now, not even researchers? And second, um, uh, what's your take on this sort of popularity that we're to the game? Oh, that's like two long questions at once. So did we expect this? Well, actually, I would say, uh, yes, uh, when I was working on this uh, at uh, Google, I was showing the results uh, to Kai Chen, who I was working with, uh, was kind of my mentor back then when I started. Uh, mm-hmm. And uh, and we both were kind of convinced that the result is uh, pretty great. And, uh, and because of the training speed that uh, many people can use it for plenty of applications and so the quality uh was very high when i did train the models on like this 100 billion words so we were like uh very enthusiastic and very optimistic about uh about the potential uh then uh, mm, there was like this case where we did submit a paper to uh first year of the of the conference uh i clear what's the shortcut international Confer- conference or learning uh representations that seems to be like perfect conference to submit a paper on learning representations of words right and it was the first year they had like acceptance rate like 70 percent uh and actually the word to vec uh work got rejected so oh. that was very upsetting because we were so much like uh believing that it, it's the big thing for the future and conference uh like uh on learning representations rejects uh such work so that uh, that wasn't nice at all. Yeah, it wasn't ah. nice at all. What was the review like? Like, what did they say? Actually, you can still find it online. That's the good thing about iClear that uh, the reviews are still online, so people can look at it. If I remember it, uh, there was one argument was that uh, the word vectors can't be perfect because they ignore the word order. So there are some linguistic phenomena that you can't capture with the word vectors uh, because they depend on the word order which I think is fine, but, uh, but you know, like, uh, sure, we didn't uh, really solve any sort of language understanding, but we have a technique to basically build uh, or compute very good representations of words from huge data sets. So it was, uh, I would say, kind of orthogonal criticism to what we are trying to achieve. Uh, and some other reviews were complaining that we should uh, discuss more of the prior work and basically the usual comments. Okay. That's, this is actually a brilliant story. So you, you you did amazing work. There was some adversity that you overcame, and now Word to Vec is a household name. So do you still get a lot of feedback, like people writing you, could you do this or that, or you know, asking for support or extensions? Actually, sometimes people still send me some emails, uh, but uh, in general, there's a Word to Vec uh, discussion forum that uh, where people should be sending the the questions. I should actually check it. I didn't look at it for quite some time because uh, now that I'm at Facebook, we have a new library that uh, that is supposed to be uh, uh, to extend uh, word to vec in various ways. Um, and word to vec is basically a subset of this library. It's called Fast Text, and uh, I did uh, basically let uh, other people to uh, develop it, uh, and uh, so I have more free time to basically spend on some different projects because. Uh, while I like the popularity of uh, word to vec it's definitely not the solution to AI. And it's a very simple tool that is maybe useful in uh, many applications, which uh, I'm very happy about. And uh, definitely, like uh, I like very much when I can develop something that, uh, that is useful to other people. Uh, at the same time, I would like to do something even bigger and better. And for that reason, uh, I'm happy to have some distance from the project. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I was about to ask you if it gets annoying at any point that, you know, where to vec is this super hit. It will be hard for you to top that, maybe. Uh, definitely, sure, sure. But uh, that's fine. Like, uh, so what? Uh, as long as uh, people are not asking me about it all the day, which uh, it was a bit like that at Google when I was about to leave. There was, uh, there was a lot of... Uh, discussions uh, with uh, other teams that I had when people were basically interested in applying word to vec and word vectors in general, like to pretty much everything. Uh, and it's nice to feel useful, but uh, at the same time, if you just spend all your time by explaining the same things again and again to people, then it really gets boring. So yeah, You don't want to be a, a one-trick pony. All right, cool. So that was word to vec So you, you made your name uh, famous and you established yourself as a world top researcher so did that help in any way in getting the offer from facebook 
Uh, sure, I think that uh, that was uh, pretty much the most visible project uh, that I did make. And uh, of course, people at Facebook were also already using Vortuvec because, as I said, I did open source it. So it was used in uh, plenty of companies. And uh, the potential was kind of clear that uh, if you can compute representations of pretty much everything over a huge data sets, uh, then you can just incrementally improve plenty of applications. And uh, yes, sure. Uh, of course, Facebook was uh, very well aware of, uh, of this work. At the same time, they were about to start a team on uh, uh, artificial intelligence research, which uh, did uh, sound interesting. And back then, when uh, when I was about to join, I had quite a few discussions with uh, with the Facebook managers to really be sure about uh, what the team is about. And uh, the goal was always stated that uh, it's not just about like doing some incremental machine learning improvements, but it's about to uh, develop basically artificial intelligence. And that's uh, exactly what I wanted to work on. Okay, so that's the vision they they sold you on. That's that's, yeah. that's cool. So now you, now you've been at Google, you've been at Facebook, and this is I think a lot of people would be interested. So what are uh, this may be a <laughs> it may not be at liberty to, to disclose, but what is research like at Google and Facebook, for example? Like I know there are like several groups internally who work on AI, maybe from different perspectives for different products. What is the environment like? Well, it also depends on the team. So um, both of these companies are pretty huge. So I think Google has by, by now like 70,000 people. I don't, I'm not sure about uh, something like that. And Facebook close to 20,000, I think. So, uh, you know, like there's plenty of teams and many managers who have completely different style of uh, how to lead things. Uh, when it comes to, for example, uh, uh, to Google, to start with that, uh, mm, there was quite some evolution about the research. So. When I joined, uh, the research at Google was, in my opinion, very much applied. So um, basically, the company was interested in taking the best existing techniques uh, that were developed by academia or maybe other companies and uh, apply them to Google products. So, so I think that was uh, the big thing uh, at Google. But uh, as uh, the company was growing bigger and bigger, they started thinking about more like longer term research as well. And... Uh, for that reason, they also did uh, buy the DeepMind startup uh, because uh, they had this uh, big story about uh, developing um, artificial intelligence, uh, like uh, the big thing, like the general artificial intelligence that will be able to do anything and not just some some stupid machine that does single task like uh, playing chess or something, you know. So that's, uh, that's the story that DeepMind did uh, sell uh, back then. And Google did go for it. I think uh, it definitely... It makes sense to do some uh, non-incremental research group. Uh, so for Google, there was uh, also Google research that was supposed to be not that much applied, but uh, I did talk with quite a few people there, and uh, and uh, most of them actually seem to be quite connected to the existing products. So I think uh, that's basically the evolution of every company. You start with uh, with a startup where you do no research at all. You just uh, go the basic things uh, to make money. And once you have the money, then you start thinking about what will be next year and uh, start applying the state-of-the-art things to improve, improve your product. And later, when your company is really big, then you start uh, uh, working on like, uh, the next big thing uh, that can come in five or, or, or 10 years from now. Uh, so that's uh, that's about Google and Facebook, I think, is very similar to Google. Uh, it's just younger company, but otherwise, uh, many things are actually quite similar. Uh, the big difference for me is that I'm now in a team that is not in the headquarters. I'm in uh, New York, and uh, that's quite some difference. So the amount of communication that uh, that we have with the other teams is uh, much lower than uh, what I did experience uh, at Google, which uh, is uh, bad for collaboration, but it's good for like some sense of freedom that uh, you may have maybe more time to think about uh, your own stuff. Uh, so it really depends. Like it's very hard to compare these things. What is better? What is worse? It depends on. Uh, what people actually enjoy. Sure, sure. I'm asking better or worse. It's just, yeah, I think this is interesting because of the internal uh, view of how these things work. So you mentioned freedom. So what, what level of autonomy you always were into research? Like you really have your eyes on the ball, on the on the big end goal of artificial intelligence. So how much freedom do you have or did you have at Google and now at Facebook uh, with regard to what you want to work on? Like well, I think with, uh, with the freedom, it's actually very good uh, in all these places that uh, I've been to so far. And if it wouldn't be, then I just wouldn't uh, be there because uh, 
I was always more interested in uh, working on the AI research than working for some particular company. So as I said, I wasn't really applying to Google or Facebook myself. It's more like that these companies uh, uh, did offer me something, uh, some exciting story and uh, wanted me to work for them. Uh, so basically, I have uh, as much freedom as I want. Uh, and I'm working on the problems that I'm excited about. Uh, of course, uh, quite a few times uh, I did uh, publish things like, say, word to vec uh, that wasn't really like some breakthrough AI research on its own. But uh, there was the times where I just did feel that uh, the um, that I have some like knowledge uh, that I should share with others because it can make uh, life of other researchers much easier. Because as I said, for example, the word to vec thing is like very very basic, and people should have uh, known. For a long time, how to train these uh, these uh, word representations efficiently, which actually turned out to be uh, kind of true in different community. For example, the language processing community did have uh, something called distributional semantics that I did learn about uh, later after I did only publish the word to vec uh, project, and they were developing very very similar techniques uh, all since I think 80s or 90s. So I wasn't really aware of it. I was uh, Looking at these word representations from the point of view of the deep learning community, the, there are people, even like very famous ones like Yoshia Bengio and uh, and others, that are convinced that you really need to train like these deep neural you know, networks uh, with uh, with uh, hidden errors and everything to be able to get uh, the word vectors. Uh, well, I did know already like uh, for a long time that uh, that uh, you really need a much simpler and uh, easier to train uh, model. So. As, uh, as I said, basically, sometimes I'm publishing things that are not really AI research, uh, but I just feel that it's useful to the community to know something. Yeah, uh, people appreciate useful things. I would say a big part of the success of this tool and other tools like Fast Text and so on is that they're easy to use and fast, like pragmatic, I would say. It's nice to have an algorithm, but if nobody knows how to really implement it, or it's, it's there's a lot of these little hidden catches when you try to do stuff for real so when you have a reference implementation and it's really nice and robust like yours was like it was uh, quite fast written and see and all that stuff that's that really definitely helps with the adoption all right so Tomas, so you're you're happy with the freedom and level of autonomy do you use and this is for the for our uh, listeners who are who use a lot of open source because that's that's a big wave now of um, using tools that are already out there rather than building stuff in house. What's the ratio in your case? Do you use tools, or first of all, technical tools to help you in your work? Which ones? And second of all, maybe even mental tools. Like, do you have processes that help you stay focused? And you know, when you're stuck with your research, you you want to do something, you don't know how. What, what do you do? Do you have a routine? Hmm. That's again two, two questions at once. So, uh, which one should I start with? Well, whatever techniques come to mind, technical, mental, whatever. Well, when it comes to um, like uh, some software techniques, uh, if you were asking about that in the beginning, then I'm not sure if I'm actually using anything special. Like, I definitely used to code much more when I was younger, uh, and I think that as as I'm growing older and older, I'm trying to work on um, important problems and less on like uh, things like uh, coding get another library for computing some language model or something so i'm not really like thinking so much about uh, uh, programming languages and so on which is the big question for many people actually that's the question that i did uh, get like many many times before like what is my favorite programming language and what i'm coding it uh, uh, coding in uh, well I think it's uh, it's really like um, not that important uh, what language you use. It's more important uh, what you work on, and so I'm not really thinking about uh, tools uh, so much. When it comes to mental tools, which is the other thing uh, that you said, I think it's actually great uh, if you can talk with uh, other people about what you are working on because uh, uh, if you want to formulate uh, what you are working on in a reasonable way, it takes some effort and uh, it helps even you to arrange your thoughts. And uh, I think that's very good. That's, that's actually a good motivation to go for conferences and talk with people. Because if you have to explain what you are working on to someone who doesn't work with you, then really it makes you think about like uh, um, even the work itself, like about uh, some important basic uh, decisions that you did make and uh, why, did you make it, uh, why did you make them? Uh, 
so I think that's actually a very nice thing to do. Mm, sure. Yeah, yeah. Verbalizing your thoughts is always useful. Yeah. So let, let's give this a, a go. So what are you working on? Uh, right now? Yeah, yeah. What's like, well, not right now. Right now we're chatting, but like, what's the long term project at Facebook that if, if you finish, you would be really happy? Uh, long term is artificial intelligence. We know the end goal, like, like but something yeah, yeah. concrete that you're working on now? Well, a concrete uh, project that um, I would say was taking uh, most of my time during the last uh, maybe two years was uh, this, uh, this uh, novel way how to see. Um, basically the data sets for artificial intelligence research. So uh, to give you an example, if you would look at uh, pretty much everything that uh, people are doing at uh, machine learning conferences uh, five uh, years back, especially the very popular results, like say recurrent networks and convolution networks, like this deep learning story, like uh, it's all the time pretty much the same thing, uh, which is like some sort of classifier. Sure, you give the machine like uh, one million examples with some labels, uh, say images, and then uh, then it gives you uh, labels for new images. Wow, great magic. That's uh, that's really great. And uh, it's very nice. And you can make uh, nice applications around it. But uh, there is the artificial intelligence coming uh, uh, from when you have like this system that basically does uh, just classification, nothing else. So because there were like... Uh, a lot of people who are claiming that these things like say recurrent networks uh, uh, kind of like understands the language and understands the images and whatever uh, and were making like these crazy stories. Uh, I wanted to make some effort to kind of organize uh, better the AI research so that people would see more clearly the obstacles in front of us. So we did uh, write this long paper uh, together with Armand and Marco uh, it's called the roadmap to machine intelligence, where we try to discuss like these high level things, how the artificial intelligence uh, can be possibly made. We don't really know how to solve all the problems, but we at least uh, try to define them, what the problems are, what people should be working on. Sorry, what was the name of this paper? Uh, roadmap uh, to machine intelligence. And it was pretty long and it was more written like in the scientific way. So very recently we did publish also a shorter version of this paper. Uh, that uh, you can check, uh, would have to look for the name, but it's like three pages long, so it's very accessible. Mm -hmm. And that's a short version of like uh, um, this framework that we are trying to push forward, uh, which is uh, based around communication. And it's, uh, it's based uh, on uh, some sort of simulation uh, where you have uh, some uh, environment uh, uh, that uh, is sending some sort of... Uh, Task, uh, tasks uh, to learning machine and the learning machine is supposed to solve these uh, tasks. So that sounds very abstract, uh, but uh, to give you some very basic example, uh, the environment uh, can, uh, for example, ask question like uh, how much is one plus one and the learner should answer two and then it gets reward. So it, it's, uh, it's uh, not based on classification one can say it's some sort of uh, reinforcement learning, but I don't really want to constrain people to think just uh, that way. It's more like a, some uh, sort of framework that is uh, much more natural. Like uh, you can imagine that uh, that uh, humans are, and living organisms learn this way that you basically interact with, uh, with the environment you are observing uh, uh, through your sensors, through like uh, eyes and, uh, and ears, some information around yourself. And then you are making some moves to actually accomplish some actions in the environment. And then if you do some good actions, then you have some built-in rewards that, uh, you know, that get activated in your brain to tell you that you did, you did uh, uh, do some good thing. So I think this is a much more natural uh, framework to approach a language understanding uh, than if you really just train a big uh, language model that tries to minimize perplexity over a huge data set, uh, which I actually like too, because I did work on that uh, the stuff for a long time, but uh, it's definitely not uh, AI complete. Uh, if you have just language models that are optimizing perplexity, there are very basic things that uh, that the state of the art techniques cannot do, and uh, it uh, it really boils down to some sort of memorization that the recurrent networks are doing. So, uh, so I would be quite critical about the state of the art of the deep learning when it comes to artificial intelligence. It's definitely not sufficient as it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. By the way, have you heard of this initiative? What was it? Open Open AI, something like that. The building uh, yeah, yeah, sure. environments. Yeah. What's your thoughts on that? Well, uh, 
they did uh, publish some uh, sort of similar thing several months after us. So we did actually publish uh, what I was just talking about, like this uh, this uh, AI environment already last summer, and the paper that describes it uh, even like uh, almost a year before that. So there was OpenAI and DeepMind who did try to publish some environments like uh, last NIPS uh, in December. Uh, so I think it's uh, it's nice that they are trying to do something. I would definitely have uh, quite a few different opinions on what they are doing. Uh, first of all, from what I've seen from OpenAI, and I didn't really study it that much, but uh, from what I've seen, it seems to be a big collection of uh, all kinds of like visual tasks, like some computer games. Uh, uh, and uh, and the authors are hoping that uh, that it will be a nice benchmark for reinforcement learning algorithms because uh, I think that they are hoping that uh, if you can uh, learn on like say thousand games and then you will try to generalize to some new game that it will be easier if the if the system will be basically pre-trained on all all these uh, other games so it's it's not the same thing as what we are aiming for so their their um, their task is basically multitask learning so. They are trying to make a machine that can uh, learn uh, from a lot of tasks and generalize to other tasks or from similar tasks, uh, which actually, by the way, is quite uh, doable for the current uh, machine learning techniques. Uh, so that may be nice, but I just uh, don't see it very much as artificial intelligence uh, because uh, you can imagine like uh, where will, will this actually lead to? Maybe in your training, so there will be some very similar games to the ones that you will be trying to solve in the test set. So it will appear to be working well, but uh, is it more like memorization or does it actually generalize? Uh, and finally, uh, where does uh, that sort of project go? Like uh, you will have a machine that can uh, learn like uh, to navigate the mouse in some environments of that sort. Uh, but uh, is this artificial intelligence? Uh, if you will show it some game like StarCraft and if you can uh, learn to play it uh, from a few hours of trials, then that would be very nice. I highly doubt that they can actually do it anytime soon. Uh, but even if they could... I can't speak for OpenAI. Just from my perspective, it's interesting that a lot of people seem to be converging on the on a similar type of project, even if not the same, but from different directions. Uh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm just trying to explain the difference because, uh, because I think it's important to have uh, the right goal in mind. And I think... Uh, that uh, that uh, the project that we actually published uh, before than the one of, um, around the communication, we didn't definitely have uh, all the big PR with uh, Elon Musk talking about uh, our work and so on, as was the case of OpenAI. But uh, but at the same time, I really believe that uh, that uh, what we are doing is more important because uh, we are aiming on what is usually called uh, incremental learning or gradual learning. Uh, there's actually many names. But the concept is that uh, you are actually trying to make machine that will be able to learn new tasks uh, quickly. So you are really like uh, uh, measuring uh, how well can it, uh, how quickly uh, can it generalize. So, so Tomáš, if, if, if people wanted to read more about this, so there's this article, I'll put the link somewhere in the description. But is there also, um, or, or are you planning to release any... Uh, part where people can play. Oh, we did release it actually. It, uh, it is on uh, GitHub already. Uh, we have uh, several data sets. So uh, just I can send you a link over Skype uh, for this paper for the latest one. Because you know what people really love is when there's something they can tinker with. You know, it can enter stuff, and you know, it does. It doesn't have to be perfect, but it can show something, and that's yeah. yeah, yeah. It's sort of data set, so it doesn't come with solution because. Uh, that's, that's the point that, uh, that uh, it's supposed to be data for the future uh, research of artificial intelligence. I'm sending you the link over Skype. Uh, so it's, uh, it's more like uh, about defining the right problem to work on. So um, we don't really want to see people spending the next 20 years uh, by optimizing some scores that actually don't correlate with the artificial intelligence uh, performance at all which I think uh, image classification is one example of that. You can actually make uh, better and better image net results uh, and so what. Like uh, it actually is not really related to artificial intelligence. And uh, it's similar if you are measuring uh, performance of, uh, of your uh, AI bot on some computer games, like uh, uh, it can be similar. Like it may actually lead to some progress, but at the same time, you may end up just with a uh, good performance on some uh, games that you did uh, um, like... Uh, 
handcode the, the solutions kind of into the system. I think prime example of that would be the chess playing from, from IBM from like the 90s, I think. Uh, uh, like it didn't really uh, lead to uh, some sort of breakthroughs uh, in AI research, at least from my point of view. And uh, then that, uh, that we would... Uh, and up with similar claims when it comes to DeepMind and their Go story. I think it's basically a copy of the IBM story with chess. Uh, it's just a different game that uh, has a uh, bigger search space, so they had to spend more time by working on the heuristics. Uh, but in the end, it's pretty much uh, the same thing. Uh, it doesn't seem to be really like uh, even part of uh, the general AI. Yeah, I'm sure they have other ideas, but yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's good to see competition uh, from different angles, at least for yeah. me. That's actually interesting. Like so many people are working on it and the hype machine is at full speed these days. It must be a lot of pressure for the researchers. You say you have a lot of freedom, but do you feel that pressure? Like the, the competing teams around the world trying to do the same stuff in different ways maybe and, and you agree or don't agree? Do you feel that? Well, there's definitely a lot of competition and uh, with uh, the amount of money that uh, companies are now paying to people who are the most visible, it's uh, getting sometimes quite crazy. I did see myself some stories where people were very happy to publish ideas that uh, did come from somebody else and claim that they are the author. So I think that's uh, that's very annoying to observe. I would even say that uh, many of the top researchers that are considered like uh, amazing are not really doing much anything else than just talking about themselves all the time. So it's it's actually quite annoying the situation as it is now. Uh, but at the same time, it. Uh, buys a lot of time for plenty of people to try to do something new. So everything has its advantages and disadvantages if you would compare the current situation to uh, how, what was the state of the AI research, uh, say, 10 years ago when I was already working on these things uh, myself. Back then, I remember there was so much skepticism and people were just interested in improving the existing uh, benchmarks like speech recognizers and so on. And, uh, and it wasn't exciting at all and just convincing people to think... Uh, about doing something new that was that was quite hard. Uh, uh, so I think that uh, the, current, the current time is very exciting. Uh, it can uh, get annoying at times, but uh, it's still better than if there would be no interest in research. So I think it's quite okay. It, it could be worse. We can agree on that. That's, uh, these are good times, yeah. exciting times for people in this area. Sure. So the pressure is there to some degree. Uh, Tomáš, uh, we're almost one hour in. This was a quite an interesting story. We finally caught up with your uh, New York, what, why you are in New York. <laughs> that was the initial question one hour ago. So now, now we're up to date. So uh, yeah. Yeah, you're at New York working on this stuff with the data sets and general AI. Now, apart from work, um, you know, people know you through mm. your work on artificial intelligence and, and your publications and from conferences and so on. But what is Tomáš like, like in personal life that that's a general question but let me be more specific so do you have any how, how do you manage the work life balance do, do you see the difference between work and fun well, i'm not so sure actually to be honest <laughs> i'm asking because a lot of people don't have that difference so I, i'm half expecting yeah. yeah well i was always trying to uh, work on things that i did consider fun so uh i don't have a problem to work on the things that i enjoy because uh Mm, well, uh, I would be uh, working on the artificial intelligence research even if I would have to pick some other because it's just like a hobby for me. Yep. So that's that's definitely exciting. Otherwise, uh, how I ended up in New York? Well, no, no, we already covered that. We already covered that. That's that's fine. Or do you have a story you can share? Uh, sure, sure. I mean, like uh, I said that I did move uh, from uh, from Google to Facebook and I d ended up uh, here. Of course, uh, Facebook has the headquarters in uh, in Menlo Park in California, so. I could have definitely stayed there, but uh, to make a short story, uh, when I was coming to California, I was completely excited about like how great it must be. Because if you look at the map, it's like very much to the south, you know, that sunny there all the time. It's just next to the ocean. So it must be amazing, right? So that's what I was thinking. But then I arrived and I realized that there's quite some cultural difference. Like it was looking completely different than the European cities. The Bay Area itself is, uh, is very different. And... Uh, I did find it, uh, to be honest, very boring. Uh, I don't know if you know the area well yourself, but uh, but in European cities, you usually have like some city center where basically people walk and you don't really have that much cars and you have shops and you can basically see some interesting stuff there and just walk around. Uh, so that's pretty nice. Uh, 
in uh, Silicon Valley, there was pretty much no nothing like this. Uh, we just had like very wide roads, plenty of cars, and uh, it was really boring. So when I had this chance to move to New York, then I did go for it because uh, New York is uh, probably the closest to European cities when it comes to US. Oh. Can you imagine all the angry tweets we're gonna get now? Oh, are you so <laughs> California is boring? How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it depends on people. Like some people just love that uh, because uh, it has different advantages. Uh, uh, for example, some people hate New York because there's too many people uh, here. I actually don't mind. I like uh, when there's a lot of people around. So it depends on uh, on the personality. Mm, sure. Yeah, New York is that's the melting pot. It's a famous city mm. for that. A lot of stuff going on in the US at the moment, but uh, yeah, let's not discuss that. That's a, mm. that's a whole another hour. So on the topic of travel, so so you traveled a lot throughout the U.S. You travel a lot for conferences. I know. Do you enjoy traveling? Uh, well, it depends which part because uh, I did travel a lot uh, for sure. I would say that uh, traveling itself, uh, when it comes to sitting in a taxi or in the airplane or waiting at the airport, that's really boring to me. Uh, when I can go with someone, it's definitely much better. When, but uh, most of the time, I'm traveling by myself and. Uh, that's really boring. It's the same all the time. You're basically waiting and waiting. Uh, and in these small airplanes, uh, it's just terrible to just sit there. So I don't really like this part. But when it comes to actually being in some new place, after you get uh, like uh, after you get used to the local time zone, which uh, means to overcome the jet lag, which is another part, uh, painful part of the traveling. But once I'm at some place and I'm feeling fine there, it's actually very interesting that you can explore something new that you see basically new things in the shops and uh, people think uh, some, uh, somewhat differently and they have new stories to share. So yeah, I actually enjoy very much that uh, part of traveling where I can actually be at some new place. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's good. Maybe you'll have extra freedom to travel and work from anywhere. Have you been to Asia? Uh, yeah, definitely. I was there uh, just last year. I think I spent there like how long? Like two weeks maybe three weeks uh, depends on what you call asia basically i did go for taiwan uh, just a year ago for like uh, i think a bit more than a week uh, i had some invited talk at a speech recognition workshop that they had there and they had uh, two more talks uh, and it was actually very exciting because i was already at taiwan in 2009 uh, at the uh, conference so i was i did already go for the second time last year uh, and it was very interesting to see the same city after uh, after like seven years. So there was a lot of fun and uh, people were very friendly and they did just tell me plenty of things. I mean, the locals, they take me like uh, for like these things like uh, to the hot springs. Uh, so it was actually very interesting. And also like uh, the local restaurants, they have basically have very different food than what we are used to in Europe. Of course, like you can go to some uh, some uh, Chinese restaurant even in US or in Europe, but it's just much more authentic if you are actually uh, at the place uh, at the at the place uh, with the local people and you can just ask them about all kinds of stupid things. So that was very much fun. From there, I did go to Korea for like uh, again, like uh, I think it was a bit more than a week, and it was very similar. Like uh, very interesting people. They did show me plenty of things. Uh, I, uh, they did even arrange uh, uh, to. Uh, meet with uh, StarCraft Pro gamers, like the best players in the world. Like uh, there was like Flash and Nada, who I did uh, kind of talk with. Uh, and when I'm saying talk with, they didn't really speak uh, English. So it was like a true, uh, true uh, uh, student who did uh, translate, but it was like very exciting. Uh, but at this point, let me interject. Tomas is a big fan of StarCraft, has been for many years. So so that's, that's why this was... Uh... A big deal, I assume. So yeah, I live in South Korea, so this is uh, this is close to heart. It's the countries always feel a little different, you know, when you're here for a week or two, or when you have to sure, live sure. there and work there. It's a different perspective, but yeah, that's fun. If you come to, to South Korea again, let me know. Uh, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> Great, Tomas. So we're gonna wrap up soon. Just um, curious about your future plans. So now you're happy, mm. I assume, happy at Facebook doing stuff. I'm never happy. Actually, I'm always thinking about what to do better because uh, you know I will be happy when we make uh, AI. And so far, we are nowhere close. So don't confuse it. I, I still think that we are. We have to do things much better. Yeah, yeah. Maybe you're like you feel challenged in the work area, but overall, like personally, you're you're happy. Oh, personally, it's fine. Yeah, yeah. All right, great. So you're gonna stay there in the foreseeable future. 
not moving to Amazon. Uh, let's see. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Great. So, Tomas, do you want to say more about what you what you're planning for the future, or maybe have a you know if, if you need um, I don't know, feedback from people or want to say something about what you're doing? This is this is the chance. A little shout out. Well, for the future, I. I really want to focus on uh, making the artificial intelligence uh, happen. I know that it sounds uh, kind of stupid. Many people have this message, uh, but I wanted to make it happen over like uh, 10, 15, 20 years ago, where when most of the uh, guys who are now talking big about AI were talking big about something really different. So for me, that was uh, pretty much always the goal. And I want to make it happen as uh, quickly as possible. And let's see what will come in the future. I will definitely try to come up with something interesting. Mm-hmm. Okay, you're really a focused guy. I can I can tell. You you, you really keep your eyes on the ball. Cool. <laughs> so best of luck with that. Um, I think this was fun. We didn't cover a lot of stuff, but uh, that's that's enough. Hopefully, we can do it again in the future. Um, <laughs> if you don't mind. Oh, well, sure. But I will come to Korea. Then we should definitely meet somewhere. Yeah, we do a live one. <laughs> yeah, yeah. From a Korean barbecue. Are, are you actually going to check sometimes? Yeah, I'll be there beginning of March in Europe, Germany, and Czech Republic. Oh, I may be actually there like late March. Uh... Oh, Jesus! <laughs> How do you manage the jet lag? You just travel all the time. Ah, uh, yeah, that's the painful part about traveling, I told you already. So I wouldn't say that I really manage it. So it just ends up that I like sleeping at random times and so on. So it's not that great. <laughs> and yeah, your family doesn't mind, I assume. My wife would kill me if I did that. <laughs> <laughs> and so, All right, you're still free to <laughs> to roam the world. Yeah. Good on you. Yeah, yeah. All right, great. So thanks again, Tomas. Um, I'll send the links to, to your work in the I'll be in the description so everyone can check out what, what you've been up to and what you're planning next sure. and uh, okay. have a have a great rest of the weekend. And that wraps up today's episode here on my podcast. Thanks for tuning in. This was the first time both for me and Tomáš, so please be gentle with us. You can find the links to the articles and resources that Tomáš mentioned on this episode's blog post at rare-technologies.com/blog.